Hello and welcome to the introduction to Meraki MV Security Cameras webinar. My name is Rachel and I'm the product marketing manager here at Meraki for our line of security cameras. So I'm really excited to be talking with you today, um, explaining a little bit about our product and hopefully highlighting some of the ways that we stand out from the crowd. Before I go any further, I do want to mention that I do have a colleague in the room who's gonna be able to answer any and all questions you might have as they come up. So please feel free as you're listening to this webinar to type those questions into the chat box or the Q&A box and we'll get those answered for you. So in today's webinar, I'm gonna be going through a brief history of Cisco Meraki. Many of you probably already know some of this information, but I do want to run by it really quickly just for those who are newer to Meraki. I'm gonna go through a little bit of an overview of the MV product philosophy and architecture. Why did we make a security camera and how is it different? I'll go through a product demo, which is really gonna be sort of the bulk of this webinar and will hopefully illustrate a lot of the points that I'm trying to make here. And then we'll go over a little bit about Meraki licensing. We'll recap on the rest of the Meraki portfolio and then I'll give you some next steps if you want to learn more or get your hands on one of these really awesome cameras. So a little bit of high level background on Meraki. We are a complete cloud managed IT solution featuring wireless switching, network security, SD-WAN, communications, unified endpoint management and security cameras. I know that's a mouthful. We do have quite an extensive portfolio now that we are really proud of, um, but it all started back in 2006 as a grad student research project out of MIT. So those grad students were researching how they could deploy a mesh wireless system throughout the city of Boston. They were presenting their findings at a conference and an investor offered them some money to start a company, and that's effectively how Meraki was born. So we continued on developing a couple other products, um, and in 2012, we were, of course, acquired by Cisco. So that's really been the catalyst that's allowed us to grow really rapidly and get into a ton of um, different customers' hands. So we have well over 250,000 unique customers at this point. We have over 5.5 million active Meraki dashboard users and over 3.5 million Meraki devices online. So those numbers are pretty um, huge at this point and we're really, really proud of it and really excited to continue on with our development. We're among Cisco's fastest growing portfolios and we are excited to be a leader in cloud managed IT at this point. So the security cameras, this is one of our newer product lines. It's not the newest, um, but it's one of our newer product lines. It launched about two years ago, so it's still pretty young. Um, but as you'll see in the next couple of slides, we've really taken this product from you know day one and grown it into a really exciting product for um, you know a large range of our customers. So why did we even think about going into this space? Well, if you look at sort of what a traditional security camera deployment looks like today, it's not that dissimilar from the little diagram you're seeing here. So we have lots of security cameras connected to lots of what we call boxes, be they servers or NVRs or DVRs, and then connected to some sort of monitoring system. Now, not only is this setup quite complex, it also introduces a lot of extra hardware costs and infrastructure maintenance when you do have those NVRs and DVRs and so on. Um, but there's also a lot of standalone software packages required Again, adding extra costs, extra complexity, and there's not a lot of flexibility here either. Because you need VPN in order to view video remotely in most systems and most people don't or can't set that up, you're really confined to viewing video locally in a network or again, going through a lot of hoops to get the video where you want it. On top of that, having these NVRs and DVRs in a closet in every single site location does introduce a big network vulnerability to your network as well. So we have to keep in mind that anything connected to the network is potentially an access point for any sort of cyber attack that may be happening. Um, 
IP cameras in particular are, of course, you know, technically they're IoT devices, but we see that a lot of these cameras, especially these legacy systems that are 10, 20 years old, have not been properly locked down in any way. So in the majority of cases, the NVR is not encrypted. The password may have never been changed from the default password, believe it or not. And people just don't really keep up with their NVRs either because there's a lot of maintenance involved in terms of making sure that you have the current version of the firmware that you need or the correct plugins or drivers or so on. So there's a lot of complexity involved, a lot of overhead involved with these older systems. We looked at this model and we thought, you know, this looks actually quite similar to some other problem that we solved in the past, which was, of course, wireless. So when you look at the old model of wireless, it's quite similar with the NVRs being replaced by something like an on-site controller. Um, so we wanted to take our learnings from changing that industry and apply that to this new industry that hasn't seen a lot of development in the past couple of decades. So we set out to apply our learned expertise in cloud, distributed computational systems, and UX design to the video surveillance world. We're really, really super hyper-focused on solving problems and not just building features for the sake of building features. So throughout our development process and continuing on our development process, we always make sure that we're talking to our customers, making sure that we're really getting at the root of what their problem is, and not just trying to build the features that people may be asking for or people may be familiar with. So keep that as in mind as I'm going through this webinar. Hopefully you'll see in a couple of places how we've sort of solved some of the big problems that people face on a day-to-day -day basis, but potentially in a new and exciting and sort of different way than um, what you'll see in the industry. So where has that landed us in terms of actual product? We, had, we now have a camera that does more than just security. So this is a security camera. Um, sorry, this is essentially one of the only security cameras from a cloud leader. And I can't stress that point enough. The amount of effort and expertise it requires to build out a global cloud infrastructure is not minimal. Um, so the process from going uh, from being a cloud leader to being a camera hardware um, vendor is a much easier path than it is to go the opposite direction. So even though you may hear from some of these older, more established security camera vendors that they're moving to cloud, if you kind of press them, often you'll find that they don't really know quite the right way to implement it. They don't have quite the right infrastructure and they just know that it's a cool buzzword that people want to hear. So we are cloud first and foremost. And so that means that's been part of the plan since day one. And we've built a product and a product architecture completely around that. So everything, of course, is managed through the Meraki dashboard, just like the rest of our Meraki products. It makes it really easy to keep an eye on everything, whether um, you're on site or whether you're remote. We now have up to 256 gigs of solid state storage on board each and every camera. And the first question we always get asked when we mention storage is, how many days does that translate in term, translate to in terms of retention? That's really going to depend on the camera that you have, the storage on board that camera, and the settings that you choose. So in my demo, I'm going to go through a little bit on how you can adjust those settings to optimize retention for your deployment. Now, the final thing is, you know, these cameras, as we continue on with development and even where they are today, we're really keen on having our customers be able to utilize their cameras as more than just security cameras, but also sensors. Effectively, um, a camera, you know, is an optical sensor. And with some of the analytics tools that we've been building into our cameras, hopefully you'll be able to see um, sort of this future vision that we have in mind for um, how people can take uh, take more advantage of the deployment that they are um, installing. So in terms of tangible outcomes from our solution versus others, you're really gaining a lot here. So when I say gaining a lot, it's actually uh, you know kind of funny because you're actually getting rid of a lot of 
uh, pieces of the old infrastructure and therefore simplifying the experience. So first off, you're getting rid of that extra on-prem hardware, the NVRs, the DVRs, and the servers that I mentioned. So again, not only removing that um, you know initial CapEx expenditure that you would have, but also the ongoing maintenance associated with those various pieces of infrastructure. It's definitely um, not insignificant to think about what it requires to maintain those types of devices over the years or the decades um, that you might have them. So definitely keep that in mind. Also, you're going to be getting rid of those standalone software packages I mentioned. You won't have to worry about any drivers or plugins or manual IP configuration anymore. All of this is done automatically, seamlessly in the background. You don't even have to think about it. And then finally, just sort of, um, you know, in terms of day-to-day -day operation, we, we still hear that many of our customers, believe it or not, are using things like VHS to pull video from their camera system. Now, not only does that sound a little bit crazy because VCRs aren't even being manufactured anymore, but it just sort of speaks to the, um, you know, bringing the day-to-day -day experience into, you know, 2018 and, um, making sure that the experience, again, is as seamless and as painless as possible. So diving a little bit deeper into the actual architecture of the product and what makes it so different, I did mention kind of quickly that there is storage on board each and every camera. Now, I want to make it very, very clear. I always sort of pause here to make this point. Um, there is a, sort of a common misconception, and it, it's a totally reasonable one, when people hear Meraki, they hear cloud, and they hear video, they automatically think, okay, they store all of the video in the cloud. This is actually not the case, and there's a really strategic reason for that. Um, when we spoke to our customers, you know, many of them have branch sites that don't have a big um, bandwidth pipe. Uh, you know, many people just don't want to or cannot afford to pay for the amount of bandwidth that would be required to back that video up to the cloud all the time. So even though there are, you know, some of these sort of consumer cameras that people are becoming more and more familiar with that are great in a consumer application where the video is streamed to the cloud all the time, we quickly realized that model wasn't going to work for our customer base for um, you know, large enterprises or distributed enterprises. So because of that, we realized this architecture was going to make a lot more sense. So these cameras are recording the video locally and storing the video on the camera itself. Now, when you want to view video, the dashboard is automatically going to recognize whether you're local to the cameras or whether you're remote. Now, in the first scenario where you are local, the video is going to automatically just start streaming from the camera to your computer over the LAN. You're not going to use any WAN overhead to do that. Now, when I'm remote, the video is going to proxy through the cloud. So we're not storing the video in the cloud in that case. We're just essentially using the cloud to get the video to your remote location. So when the cameras are just sitting and recording and nobody's actively viewing them, they're going to be using less than 50 kilobit per second of upstream bandwidth per camera. That number currently is actually quite a bit lower than 50 kilobit per second. We did give ourselves a little bit of wiggle room, um, you know, if and when we're going we continue to develop features, but we've given ourselves sort of this hard limit of 50 kilobit per second um, as a as a design limitation. So that's going to be the maximum. Now, what actually comprises that 50 kilobit per second, if not video? We do store some configuration data, thumbnails, and metadata in the cloud for sort of easier access. And that allows us to employ this hybrid video processing technique that's quite unique. Our cameras all have processors on board, and so video is being analyzed on the camera itself. But then we take some of that data uh, that comes as a result of that um, that onboard processing, and we store that in the cloud. So we, we motion index in the cloud. Um, and you'll see in the demo how that translates to getting really rapid results from dashboard. I also wanted to take a minute to recap and sort of um, elaborate on the network security element that I, that I spoke about earlier. So, you know, this camera was built by a company that has a firewall security appliance in its lineup. Um, you know, customers all around the world do trust us with their overall network security. So 
you can be sure that this camera is sort of built on the backbone of that product and that infrastructure. So security is, of course, extremely important to us as a company who is first and foremost a networking company. So how do we maintain um, you know, the security of these endpoints uh, in a system? First off, video at rest is always going to be encrypted. So that's already an improvement over um, you know, the NVR, which most people don't have encrypted. Some do, but typically we don't see the NVR being encrypted. So video stored on the camera is going to be encrypted. Then video during transport is also encrypted. So the first time that your camera comes online, it's automatically, you know, kind of, as we say, silently going to purchase and provision its own publicly signed SSL cert. So we're no longer having to deal with, um, you know, manual purchasing and provisioning and um, self-signed certs that can be kind of scary. This is all done, again, seamlessly and silently in the background. You don't even really know that it's happening. And then finally, all Meraki management data across all of our products is also encrypted. So you kind of have this end-to-end -end encryption um, model that's making sure that your system is going to be really, really secure. And not only this, but all of this encryption is on by default. You actually cannot turn it off, so we don't allow you to be um, less secure. And the other thing is that since this is a cloud product and since we are you know, going to be pushing new firmware updates, new software updates over time, you can be really confident that if any problem does arise and there's a new cyber threat that occurs that um, you know, can get in through the cameras for whatever reason, you can be really confident that we're going to be rolling out a fix just as quickly as we can. So again, you, there's no manual effort involved there in terms of having to install a fix or a patch or anything like that. It'll all be sort of that, um, you know, really seamless experience. So I also want to take a minute to kind of highlight some of our newer hardware because this has been a really exciting announcement for us. Um, it's already been a couple months, but we did announced the MV12 back in February, and it's still very exciting. So MV12 is the newest addition to our product line. It's a family of indoor mini dome cameras, and these cameras in particular were designed for more than just security. So I'm gonna dive into what that actually means. The MV12 features three SKUs, um, up to 256 gigs of integrated storage, records in high definition 1080p, it does have a microphone in case you do need that audio capability. It is wireless capable as well, which I'm going to dive into in a second. It has a really nice new compact form factor. It's very discreet. And it has a Qualcomm Snapdragon processor on board. So, of course, that's the very same processor that's being used in many, many smartphones around the world today. So we are effectively putting you know, mobile-grade silicon on board each and every single camera. Now, what that's allowing us to do is advanced onboard analytics and machine learning, again, on the camera itself. So it's almost like you have a smartphone packed into every single camera that you're going to deploy. So just a little bit of elaboration on the model details here. We do have the three SKUs. We do have wide um, field of view and narrow field of view cameras because these are fixed lens cameras. So you're not gonna be able to do any sort of optical zoom. However, we do have a um, sensor crop tool that will kind of allow you to do sort of a digital zoom um, without any loss of quality. Now, diving into that sort of machine learning and advanced analytics, what did I actually mean by that? Those are sort of you know fluffy terms that you hear a lot coming out of San Francisco and the Silicon Valley. Um, so these cameras are actually going to be able to do object detection um, on the camera itself. So what that is going to look like in our camera is person detection. So effectively the camera will be able to tell is something in the frame a person or is it not a person? Now this is not to be confused with facial recognition. There are some privacy concerns associated with facial recognition, of course. Um, so this is gonna be an anonymized person detection ability. So if somebody does leave the screen and then they come back in the screen, they will be counted twice. But of course there are really easy ways of um, sort of making sure that your deployment um, has that, that level of accuracy, whether it's 
putting the camera above an entrance only door, for instance, you can get a more accurate um, count of people coming through that door. There's lots of different um, design tools that you can use there. Uh, so using this sort of basic person detection ability, we're able to then do things like people counting to better understand um, customer behavior patterns or student behavior patterns on a campus or in a store location. Now I wanna stress that this sort of functionality, you can find it elsewhere. I'm sure many of you have gone to a physical security trade show and seen all of these really cool, shiny, flashy analytics demos. The problem with the solutions that are out there today is that they all require really bulky and really costly servers in order to um, work properly. And that is not typically going to be a viable solution at particularly, you know, smaller branch locations. Also, you know, we haven't really seen too many cost effective solutions because of the, again, the infrastructure required and the sort of configuration and setup required in order to get this data. So I wanna stress that, again, all of the analytics that I'm showing you and I'm gonna show you in the demo, those are all happening on board the camera itself. So that sort of processing power and that compute power is going to scale with every camera you purchase. So whether you have one camera that you wanna put up in a very small location or in a closet somewhere or whatever may be the case, or you have a thousand cameras that you're going to deploy across the world in you know hundreds of different locations, it doesn't matter. You're gonna be able to scale very quickly and easily because you don't need the extra infrastructure. I also use the term machine learning. Some of you may be wondering, what does that actually mean? We hear it all the time, but nobody actually you know, talks about what it means tangibly. It simply means that the cameras are going to get smarter over time. So as more and more people deploy these cameras, we're gonna be able to collect some of that metadata and feed that back into our software so that it gets better at recognizing, again, what is a person and what's not a person. So we're gonna see increasing accuracy over time with these cameras. I also mentioned that these cameras are wireless capable. So what does that mean and why is that important? Well, when we talked to customers um, in the early days of releasing MV, a lot of people asked for wireless cameras. And when we kind of grilled them on you know, what they were actually looking for and why they wanted wireless cameras, and more importantly, how they were gonna power those wireless cameras, we quickly realized that the problem that people were having was actually that they didn't want to recable their um, different site locations because of course recabling is really expensive in and of itself. It also requires lots of downtime in order to do. So we wanted to get the heart of that problem. Um, and so in doing that, not only did we come out with a wireless camera, but in the fall, we'll also be releasing a power injector that's going to allow people to more easily upgrade their old existing analog camera systems. So old analog camera systems um, typically have what we call a Siamese cable um, leading to them. There's the coax, which is transmitting data, video data. And then we have the, um, the power cable. So that power cable is gonna be attached to a low voltage power supply typically. Um, it's typically quite old and, and sort of, you know, in a, in a closet somewhere. It may also be powering things like um, badge readers and door, uh, you know, powered doors and things like that. So the way that our power injector and our wireless camera solution is going to solve those problems is when you want to upgrade these sites that do have analog um, cameras, you're simply going to take the old camera off unplug the coax and effectively leave it where it is. You can rip it out of the wall. You can do whatever you want, but it's not going to be used anymore. Then you're going to take the power line and you're going to plug that into our power injector and that is going to convert to PoE. And then you'll run the camera off of that converted PoE power supply and the data will transmit wirelessly. So effectively, you're not having to actually rip any cables out of the wall. You're just plugging in this new power injector and running the, da the data wirelessly. Now, the reason that you know these other camera vendors have tried to do this, but it hasn't really taken off and hasn't really worked properly, there's a couple of reasons. First off, 
you know, they're not wireless uh, vendors. We are wireless experts. Wireless is not an easy thing to get right. And so we do have the experience um, there. The other thing is the architecture. So if you think about these older systems that are running to an NVR or DVR um, system, if the wireless um, has any sort of interference or there's an outage or whatever the case may be, because of course there are always going to be some lapses in wireless, even 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 Meraki wireless, you know, wireless as a technology is inherently going to have um, some downtime. If you are trying to offload that video to an NVR, you simply lose that footage if you don't have the connection. So with these systems that have the NVR, the wireless doesn't really work reliably. Now, because our video is stored on the camera itself, even if you do have some sort of wireless interference or something happens, um, the camera will continue to record video. You just won't be able to access it until you do regain that wireless connectivity. So we are uniquely sort of positioned to be offering this solution. And we're really excited to see our customers, um, you know, be able to upgrade some of these older site locations or more difficult site locations without needing to put in so much um, cost and effort. So this is going to be available in fall of 2018. It's not yet turned on. All MV12 hardware purchased today will um, support wireless. We just have not flipped it on on the software side yet. Now I want to make it really clear because we do get this question a lot just to clarify. The cameras do run off of a standard PoE switch in sort of a your standard deployment. So they are operated um, using PoE. And, you know, of course, we recommend that as, as the first choice because a hardwired connection is always going to be more reliable than a wireless connection. Um, but this is basically offering a secondary option for those um, older sites or remote sites or that corner of your office that, um, you know, you just can't recable at this point in time. So without further ado, I'm going to dive into a product demo here. So we're looking at the Meraki dashboard right now. I'm going to come to our cameras page. And I want to point out, you know, I'm just using Chrome right now. I could use Safari, whatever I want. I just need a modern web browser and any computer. So I want to stress the point that, you know, if you go on vacation and you leave your work computer at work, as I hope you do, um, and someone calls you up with any sort of issue, you can actually log on from, for instance, the business center um, at your hotel. You don't need to have this dedicated computer with this dedicated software in order to, um, you know, be able to troubleshoot and view what's going on. Now, this page um, shows a list of all of our cameras running in our network and whether they're online, offline, or dormant. If you've watched any of our other webinars, you've probably seen this page, but it's very likely that the person demoing probably just kind of breezed past this because in the networking world, this is sort of expected, right? You expect to know if your access points are online or offline. And if you didn't know that, you'd be pretty upset. Now in the security camera world, this type of functionality, even though it makes a lot of sense, is not standard at all. So I can't tell you the number of times I've heard customers tell me the same story. They had an incident, maybe a laptop got stolen. They were asked to retrieve the video. They went to the find the footage only to find out that that camera had been offline for the last three weeks. But they really had no um, robust way of knowing that that was the case until they went to go try to retrieve the footage. And that's just not a practical way of dealing with, um, you know, camera systems. It's not proactive. It's very reactive. And unfortunately, in most cases, the person who gets the blame for that is whoever was asked to pull the video, even though it likely was not their fault. So just having this proactive view, being able to get offline device alerts, being able to see if your cameras are online or offline, is going to be hugely, hugely valuable on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, I'm going to dive into one of my cameras here. And this is going to load up with a live view. Again, I didn't have to install any plugins. I didn't have to do any IP configuration in order for this to happen. And now we're looking at a live view of one of the cameras in the office. So if I want to go back in time, I can go to 8 a.m. yesterday. 
We do have natural language processing built into our cameras. We wanted to make it really simple and straightforward for everyone to operate, even if they're non-technical, because we know that in many, many cases, the person operating the camera system is not gonna be a, a completely technical person. Now from here, not much going on, but maybe I wanna see the last time that somebody walked down the staircase. Um, so I can select this area and then we quickly pull up this list of results. Now this list of results is populating from that motion metadata that I mentioned that we store in the cloud. So the video feed is coming from the camera. These results are coming from the cloud. And now as I, as I pick one of these results, you'll see that we overlay that information, the motion metadata on top of the video feed. Now I also am gonna hit the show people button here and here we go. And so now the camera is basically assessing what is a person and what's not a person in the frame. From here, I can either export the video and I'll get a link that I can share or I can download the file to my computer. It'll be watermarked with the date and timestamp as well as the, the camera name. Um, or I can download that to my computer and keep it indefinitely. So that person detection functionality I showed you is sort of just a nice thing for show and tell, but isn't going to be really valuable unless you can get some data out of it, right? So I'm gonna go to our analytics page and show you how that um, data actually gets rolled up. So I'm gonna go to maybe Wednesday here and I'm gonna go to an earlier point in time. So we're gonna start looking at 3 a.m. And what's really nice about this tool is that you can quickly see anomalous behavior. So whether it's a spike in traffic or a lull in traffic, I'll be able to quickly identify that. So we can actually see that there were some people in the office um, around 5 a.m. So I just wanna dig into you know who was coming in this early. I know I definitely don't. So I'm gonna click on this bar here and I'm gonna fast forward a little bit we do give you a little bit of video on either end as um, sort of buffer so you can see the context of the situation. So in a second here, we should be seeing somebody walking through the area. And there we go. So somebody's walking up the stairs and that's what triggered that um, bar chart to read out as um, having detected a person. So again, this is going to greatly reduce the time required to identify incidents and recover incidents um, and just investigate what's going on. So whether it's more for a security application, like in a school, for instance, if we see a spike in activity overnight, we can investigate who was on campus at nighttime, or it could be in a retail scenario where you just wanna know what foot traffic is looking like, what the busiest times of day are, you'll be able to get that from our analytics tools. Now I'm gonna show you some of our camera settings because I did mention the quality and retention. So this is a big question that people ask, how many days of storage can I get out of this camera system? It's really, again, going to depend on the particular cameras as well as the settings that you choose. So first off, we can set a schedule if we wanted to. So if we know that we don't need to record overnight for whatever reason, we can um, make sure that the cameras aren't recording overnight and we can simply set a new schedule. All we have to do is drag and drop these little time pickers, save this effectively as a template and that's it. So I'm not going to turn that on right now, but I am gonna show you our motion-based retention tool. So motion-based retention is going to differ from sort of your standard run-of-the-mill motion-based recording that you may be familiar with from other camera systems. So motion-based recording, sort of the older version, is effectively a hardware tool, right? There's gonna be a little sensor on the camera that's going to detect if there's motion or, or if there isn't. And the camera is either gonna turn on or not turn on. Now the problem is when the camera doesn't sense motion and so it doesn't turn on, but there actually is something interesting happening, you just lose the footage. So when you have these false negative scenarios, you end up with no footage. We've heard from some of our customers that you know this has definitely affected them. For instance, we had a customer who said that their sprinkler system went off over the weekend, they came back, their office was flooded, 
and they try to retrieve the video, but it turns out that the water falling from the sprinklers hadn't been enough to trigger their motion-based recording. So they ended up with a soggy office and no video. Now, motion-based retention as we've implemented it is different. Our cameras are going to record all the time, 24 seven, and we're gonna store the most recent three days in their entirety. So if any of those like big crazy incidents do happen, you'll have the full amount of footage from the last three days, just in case. After that three days, our software is gonna go in and it's gonna trim out the segments of video that don't have any motion. So we're doing this in a more nuanced way on the software side um, that gives us some more flexibility. Now, the nice thing about having motion-based retention enabled on our system is that we do give you this real-time readout at the bottom here. This is gonna be actual motion detected by this particular camera over the last week. So this particular camera sees about eight hours of motion on average per week. Um, now, you'll see that if I toggle between turning off motion-based retention and turning it on, or if I toggle to 720p instead of 1080p, this number is changing in real time. So we can see you know, an actual estimate of how much video we expect from this particular camera. So there's no guesswork involved there. I'm not going to save the settings here, but I will show you our motion alerting tool. So um, I did show you motion search, which allows you to sort of go back in time and find an incident that may have occurred, but maybe you want to get an alert sort of more in real time if something is happening that shouldn't be happening. So um, let's say you work at a school and you want to make sure that people are not coming onto campus during off hours. So I'm going to set up a schedule here. You know, after people leave and before people come back onto campus, I want to know if people are going to be entering campus. So I'll just set up the schedule. I'm not going to go through the whole process right now. Then I hit save, and I can save that as, for instance, an off hours template. Um, then I'm going to set a minimum event trigger. So if we want to make sure we're not catching, you know, that tree rustling in the wind, but we want something more meaningful. I can set this threshold a bit higher. And then I can set a physical threshold. So if I wanna know when somebody came through a door over the weekend or during off hours, I can simply select that area that's going to trigger that motion alert. And now the dashboard's going to send me an email or the, it can send me an SMS um, whenever you know something is kind of fishy maybe, or um, maybe it's more for process controls, right? Uh, maybe you work in manufacturing and you want to know when a certain process is completed. You can do that using motion alerts. So jumping over to our video wall now, if you want to get more, um, basically more angles um, and you want to see more video feeds in one place, we do have our video wall tool. It's very easy to use. You can see there's multiple video walls that we have saved up here. So you can um, put up to 16 cameras uh, or video feeds in a single video wall. And if you need more than that, you simply can open another tab in your browser since we are just using a standard browser. Now I can hit edit layouts if I wanna add more video feeds to this video wall. And the nice thing is that we give you an estimate of how much bandwidth this video wall is gonna consume if you're going to be remotely streaming it. So you can be more cognizant of what you can expect um, from this video, uh, video wall. The last thing I'm gonna quickly show you is our administrative tool. So this is sort of a, um, not, as, not as cool because it's not as visual, um, but it is almost a, a sort of a best for last. Um, people are really excited about this functionality. So if you want to add different users to your camera network, um, but you don't want them to have access to your, you know, your actual network network, um, you can add them as a camera only administrator. Um, this is, you know, applicable not only to security guards and so on, but you can start thinking about giving access to people in HR or in marketing or um, a school principal, for instance, if you do uh, have a school district. So all I have to do is hit create new user. Um, let's say that I am you know, running a school district and I wanna give access to a particular principal. I'm gonna call her Sarah 
and we'll just add Sarah's email address. We'll say that Sarah can view footage but not export for privacy reasons for the kids. Um, and then we'll do cameras by tag. So we'll say elementary school number one. That's the school that Sarah works at. And now she'll have access in a matter of you know minutes uh, she'll have access to those particular cameras. Now, not only is this great for, again, those additional staff members who maybe didn't have access previously, but you can also give access to first responders. So whether you want them to pull video files themselves, if there's some sort of um, special chain of custody rules in your region, or if um, you know there is an active scenario happening and for whatever reason they're locked out of the building, they can't go inside, you know, in more traditional security camera systems, it's not really a viable option to be able to log in remotely from any device. So from a phone or a computer or whatever may be the case, um, typically you need VPN and uh, you know that special software once again. So having the ability to give access to whoever needs it is um, you know really profound and, and means that it's gonna be really easy to share video with whoever needs it. I do want to share a quick story about this. You know, I just spoke with a customer who said they didn't have an incident at their store location, but there was an incident down the street, some sort of bank robbery. And the police went around to all the different local retailers to get their um, security footage so that they could put together a story. They went to um, this customer of ours and pulled the video file in a couple of minutes and had said that this was actually the easiest security footage retrieval process they had ever experienced. And they were actually quite um, amazed at how, how quick and easy it was. So that's always exciting to hear, um, you know, a real case, real world scenario of where this came in handy. Now, jumping back to uh, my slides, I'm gonna um, run through a couple more of these and then wrap up and let you get on with your day. So just to recap on sort of the vision we have for the cameras, um, you know, this world where the camera is not just a security camera. I mean, it does a great job of that, but it's also providing this added business intelligence. We do that in a couple of ways. We have motion search, which allows you to isolate these key events, go back in time and export them without having to watch hours and hours of footage. We have motion heat maps that are going to allow you to see relative motion patterns in a given area um, over time. So you can, you know, sort of more qualitatively at a high level, really um, quickly see, you know, what's the busiest day of the week or the busiest hour in the day. And then we have person detection with machine learning um, that feeds into our people counting tool that's gonna allow you to see those um, traffic patterns or spikes in activities. I also wanna make it clear that the person detection functionality is only available on our MV12 cameras because they have that advanced processor. Everything else is available on all of our camera models, but if you are looking for that specific person counting ability, you're gonna want to go with the MV12. I also want to stress um, you know, just how useful our dashboard is, even just by default. So this dashboard has been a work in progress for the past, you know, decade plus. So we have a lot of experience in making sure that this dashboard is going to run smoothly. So a lot of our just day-to-day built-in functionality that's kind of, you know, not that exciting for us to talk about even is going to be really hugely helpful and exciting in uh, a security camera deployment. So things like two-factor authentication, local time zones, automatic firmware upgrades, offline device learning, connectivity history, and network insights. Those types of things are just standard. They're just run of the mill in our dashboard. Um, but they're, those are the types of tools that are gonna make your day-to-day -day workflow that much um, better. We also get tons of questions about what's coming next. I know this is a really exciting product line and we've been pushing out new um, features and even hardware very quickly. Uh, so even though I'm not allowed to talk about you know, the specifics of our roadmap, I do wanna talk about some of our development principles to give you a better idea of where we're headed. So we have three main development principles. The first is gonna be cost reduction through architectural simplification. That's things like removing the NVR from the equation and getting rid of that on-site um, you know, infrastructure and additional capex. Operational simplification through automation, referring to things like um, automated offline device alerting or motion alerts or um, you know, the automated purchasing of those um, SSL certs for each and every camera. And then finally, 
and sort of the more future facing um, principle is business value through intelligence. So we want to continue providing more and more intelligence to our customers through this um, device. And we really, again, see this moving more towards being not just a security camera, but also a sensor that's going to improve operations for schools and businesses and whatever um, you know other organizations may need them. So recapping on the full MV lineup, we do have the MV12, that's the fixed lens mini dome camera with advanced analytics, comes in three models. We have our MV21, that's gonna be verifocal, so it does have optical zoom built in, um, and those are our two indoor offerings. And then we have MV71, which is our outdoor offering. It's IK10 and IP66 rated for those demanding environments. So even if you have a more demanding environment that's not outdoor, you may still want to go with the MV71. In terms of licensing, licensing for MV works just the same way that it does for the rest of the Meraki portfolio. So for each piece of hardware you purchase, you are going to purchase a license as well. That license can cover one year, three year, five year, seven year, or 10 year terms. Um, and that's going to uh, give you a three year hardware warranty. It's also going to give you so access to all of our new software updates, new features, bug fixes, and so on. Um, as an example of that, for instance, our people counting tool was not available when the MB12 first launched, but weeks later, all those customers who purchased the MB12 were able to, um, you know, they basically woke up to this people counting tool now uh, being in their dashboard. So we do roll out features and updates all the time, and it's um, basically going to increase the value of your investment over time. Now, the final piece that you get from the license that I actually think is hugely, hugely valuable is going to be our 24-7 end user support. So our in-house support team is incredibly smart. Um, they're very technical, and they're going to be able to help you out via phone, email, or even in dashboard. So since this is a cloud product, you know it's possible for them to request access from you. And if you give them access to your dashboard, they'll be able to help you troubleshoot um, in real time you know, on your actual deployment so you can resolve the issue much more quickly. And wrapping up on the rest of the Meraki portfolio, again, we do have access points, security appliances, which includes SD-WAN, um, switching, enterprise, enterprise mobility management, endpoint management, um, a WAN analysis, network analysis tool, Meraki Insight, which is brand new, and then of course our security cameras. So this is a complete cloud managed IT portfolio, single pane of glass management, everything is managed through that dashboard I show you. Nobody else has this breadth of offering that we have available. In terms of next steps, definitely check out um, a risk-free evaluation. That's the best way to get your hands on our equipment and just see if it's gonna work for you. Um, you know, you can watch a bunch of webinars and they're hopefully really helpful and useful, but I definitely recommend that you just get your hands on these products um, to understand how they can work for you. You can learn more on our website and blog. That's the best place to see, um, you know, new feature updates and new product releases and so on. So meraki.cisco.com slash blog. And then, of course, definitely get in touch with your Meraki sales rep who's going to be able to get you set up with that evaluation or just answer any um, additional questions you may have. And that about wraps up this webinar for today. So thank you so much for joining me. I hope this was um, a, a good use of your time. Definitely check out the rest of our webinars if there's any other Meraki products that you're considering. And otherwise, have a great rest of your day.